fashion at Trans Am Worldwide is taking concepts that existed on antique American muscle cars and understanding them. When these cars came out, what did it say? What was the oh, statement? You didn't have enough money to get one. Is that right? <laughs> that was a dream car. Put an hydrogen tank in the second stage now pressurizing. The stage is reporting ready for launch. Look at that rock and roll! Yeah. Honey, hush. When the sun rises, when the sun rises. Like yeah. 10 years, I think we've been making videos yeah. together, which wow. is awesome. To see the evolution of the Trans Ams through that, you. You were doing GTOs as well. When you finally approached making the 70 SS, what was the history that you have with it that brought you to the point where this is the next car? For me, the 1970 Chevelle is irrefutably one of the most popular cars of the muscle car era. Todd said, what about 70? I looked at that immediately. First thing out of my mouth is, yes, let's do the 70. The 70's perfect. General Motors killed it on that car. There's so many intersections on this car. This was an ambitious car for General Motors. I mean, to take a risk at having oh, this yeah. come together, yes, this come together, these, this has to line up. It's the stance of the car, how big and fat and wide the car was, more than any other muscle car I think ever made, that car screams muscle car. The car is three inches wider than an Alpha chassis car on both sides, so that's always what we'll be dealing with. That's two to three? Or yes. Could, yeah. yeah, each side. Yeah. I did want to do a wide body car. That's just another one of those little romantic things in automotive. Sorry, that's his dream car. The car, when we're finished, is 14 inches long or 6 inches wider than the gun. That is a gorgeous car. My wife's got a 70 SS already. I take the pictures of this home, go back to work and make some more money because that's probably what she's gonna want. Old ladies, young kids, hot rodders, grandfathers, military, police, criminals, bank robbers. Every single person that ever considered what car they would choose, they'd never walk past a Chevelle. What prompted you to make sure you had a 70 model to represent the Chevelle? I just think the style of it, the body style, to me, it's just a beautiful machine. It doesn't have like overly embellished predator character. It's just sort of a serious face. That type of classy muscle, for it to be that smooth, have that few highlights or drastic details, but still make such an obvious statement. It's probably the simplest and most complex concept that I've ever had to dig through. It's like the heart of muscle car. It is amazing how much ground it covers in such a subtle yeah. way. Because, I mean, when we look at the Trans Ams, it's a pretty loud statement. And I love it. But then that's probably a really neat full circle of you getting to explore both doing something that is as loud as the Trans Am is design-wise and then getting to do this, which is, it got this subtleness to it, but it has a stance just looking at it. Exactly. Growing up, we had a Chevelle in the family. My mom had one. That car was part of our family. Wednesday night, choir practice. Dad's at the track on Saturday, and the whole family's piling in on Sunday to go to church. And it fits in every one of those environments.
the reason for green is the first 454 LS6 Chevelle made is believed to be green. So I'm tinning up this bronze for the hood stripes, and I'm just trying to get the exact shade and really accentuate the envy green. This is the gold I started with. I cut that back to three grams of black. So you see how it's really yellow and that's yep. really gray, and this is halfway between here and here. So let me clear coat it. There's our stripes, that and that. And that matches the wheels yep. really, really nice. Oh, nice. Showtime. That was one reason. Okay. And the other one just kind of fell into my lap, and that was my mom's car. Her Chevelle was green. It's quite the trivia. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was 14 years old and I befriended a couple of older guys who were in college and they had a 396 SS Chevelle. So I was the 14 year old kid in the back seat looking out between the two bucket seats as we drag raced all over town in that car. And I don't think we ever lost a race. I mean, back in those days, man, if you, if you had uh, 300 horsepower, you were king of the road. <laughs> Packages of uh, excess of 1,500 wheel horsepower. You don't have to hot rod our cars. We'll hot rod it before you buy it. We've got a new performance technician that's just going to blow the roof off of it. Between me, our calibrator, and another team of guys that are joining us, we have a combined over 40 years experience in the late model GM vehicle platforms, and especially in the LT direct injection platforms since they've released. We've been at the forefront forging the way as far as reliable horsepower numbers go. Something capable of a sub nine second quarter mile, but you can start it at six o'clock in the morning and go to work in it. Mike does our tuning. He makes sure that it's got drivability because when you get to the horsepower levels that we do, you want it to feel like a stock car, except when you press on the gas. Trans Am's tuner is one of the big elements of growth. We're gonna offer a standard NA out of the box 6.2. 450 horsepower, same as back in the day. Then we can supercharge that, get it to 650 range. The next step from there is the 396. The 396 is supercharged, like you see here. It's an 800 wheel horsepower combo. We offer a twin turbo version at 900 wheel. <laughs> Who's getting that one? Where's that one going? I don't know. It doesn't have an order. It's free. Oh, that We're ordering. We're ordering now. I knew. Are you on camera right now? Yeah. There is a I'm on camera now. I knew I shouldn't have been here. But I will tell you, the pilot car has the best manners of any of the cars that we've built. To be 800 at the wheel, 950-ish at the crank, and to be able to handle like it does, I'm really impressed with that 396. Take that one's got my attention, yeah. I think it was a good setup, too, on the tire combination. 295s in the front, 325s in the rear. Because we, we were at 305s and we reduced it down. I think it's the right call. They're all utilizing the highest grade components you could possibly use as far as internals go. Forged crank, forged rods, forged pistons, aftermarket casted heads on the 454 package. I looked at the original schematic from General Motors and they have a blueprint layout of exactly how the stripes are done. And in 1970, when they came out with the cow induction hood, they changed the layout of the stripes. So we're going with the second version of it. And what the schematic says is that on this side over here, the stripes end 0.95 inches away from the tip. They're 2.28 inches from this body line that runs right down here. 0.3 of an inch wide with a 0.28 inch gap. And from the center line, it's 1.66 inches to here. What I did was I converted out all over to millimeters so I can get it really precise. And I've got everything all laid out exactly to the original schematic and it's within one millimeter anywhere. So it's probably better than it was done from General Motors initially. It's gonna be visibly better than a factory paint job. You know, those cars nowadays, they're sprayed with robots. They actually have lasers that measure the thickness of the paint as they're spraying. Both the base coat color and the clear and they keep it to a bare minimum. We're not worried about that. We're worried about putting the best quality finish we can. And so I'm using plenty of product to make sure that we've got enough to sand and buff at the end. The factories spray it nice and slick, but they leave an orange peel flutter on the surface. And that's to be expected with an OEM paint job. This is gonna be a show quality custom paint job that's like glass when we get done with it. It starts life as a six gen Camaro, so the newest okay. year Camaro. Yes, what we do is we'll arrange a donor car for you to buy. We you know, strip it down to a rolling chassis. The whole body's carbon fiber that we mold and do it right in house. Dude, it's sick. It's sick. Everything about the stance, the wheels, the back end, the yeah. front end. Like, it is so tied together so well. We got the proportions of it. I just love it. Thank you. Absolutely.
great, great, great. And now we're in the process of designing a hard top. This will be removable. Really high quality composites. 100% of the body is carbon fiber. Hey, you did a great job of replicating. Who's making the panels for you? We, we do everything in house. Yeah. Yeah. We design it, we engineer it, uh, we produce all of our own molds. We have seven stations that it transitions through. Now we're replacing close to 500 molds. Wow. The composite department has changed dramatically. Yeah. I mean, we've got walk-in freezer now that we have to keep our pre-preg in. We have an oven I could drive my truck into. Looks so good. It really does. This gutter, John did good. Yeah, he did. He did really clean work in here. That might be the best seam sealer I've seen here. That's what I'm saying. That's why, that's why this looks in the door jam. It's just so tight. One of our goals is to be able to take any part off one car and put it on another car and have it fit seamlessly. John played a key role in that. He's got the surgical hands, delicately making sure when these parts come out, if we need a change, he's the one that's going to identify what that change is. A lot of times the updates happen in the composites department. We'll take the part that we started with, modify it, and if necessary, we'll create an entirely new mold for that one particular part just to get the best product we can. Being able to do that all in-house again, I mean, that See, communication, right? Yeah, you imagine having to call and try to communicate these changes over the phone or with pictures right. and then waiting on somebody to facilitate it and then having it shipped here. Right. You've wasted a month. And you're coming at them at a random time. They, Who knows what their right. pipeline of work is. Everyone here is dedicated to this project. This is a full carbon fiber body. Oh, it is? Yeah. This is carbon fiber. Then you've got the 454. Those will start at 1,500 rear wheel horsepower. Well, what voodoo are you guys doing in this facility? 1,500 at the rear wheel. Oh my gosh. Yeah. The 454, we do supercharge at 900, twin turbo at 1,000, and then that's a reflection of the twin turbo 1,500 wheel horsepower combination. Oh my God. Yeah. So we're able to do those big power numbers on E85. But what the car does is if you have 93 octane in the tank, you'll get a base scale of about 800 wheel horsepower. And we do the boost by speed ramp based off the front wheel. So for about zero to 40 miles an hour, you'll get about 10 pounds of boost, extremely controllable. And then from 40 on up to about 60, it'll ramp up to its peak boost number. And then based on how much ethanol content you put in the tank, it's gonna change that peak number all fully automatically. So there's no use of a laptop, no plugging in, no changes, no switches. It's all dependent on how much fuel you put in the tank. Where it's gonna be a matter of applying power at different times in order to make it safe, extremely powerful, extremely fun, and obviously you get your adrenaline pumping. Let's do these turbos. Yeah, those are precision 6870s, dual ball bearing. You know, that's gonna get us to that power level we need and we powder coated those the same color as the block. We use twin turbos on this setup. Oh, there's, there's, this one doesn't have twin turbos. Yeah, it does. It does? They're, they're, down, they're downtown. Well, we go downtown. There you okay. go. Yeah, they're underneath. As far as the GM power plants go, there's no companies out there offering a 1500 wheel horsepower package, something that we're gonna model time and time again. As you can see over my shoulder, uh, we're ready to build 20 454 combinations and then the blocks that are stacked up behind us. Iron block, 454, we're only doing 25 of these. We will only build 25 of those. No way. I didn't know that. Total. This car, people love this car. How important is it to you personally that people that love this car are gonna love this interpretation of it that you're bringing to the market? The whole objective here is to bring something to the market that people like. We set out to address every detail that was reasonably possible to do. To some, the fact that we're even doing anything new is going to be objectionable to them. Right. And then you're going to have the other end of the spectrum. They're going to love it. It is something new. It looks like the old, but I can drive it from here to California, yeah. and I'm not going to worry about it running hot, smelling fumes, you know, all the <laughs> right, things right. that your wife used to complain about when you had the, <laughs> the muscle car. You know? with huge tires with lots of grip, high-end suspension components, low stance, wide, road hugging, you had to stretch some proportions to make all that stuff work. Make the car feel like it is supposed to feel, and that's something that you'll always hear me say. It's not about anything other than how it makes you feel. Ultimately, it's not an insane amount that were ever made. It's not like a completely saturated market, and those were made so long ago. When you reference 1970, we're talking 
50, half a century ago. I know. So you can let it just completely be only that stamp in time, or you can have a little bit of fun, lighten the guard, and, and explore a little bit of what artists want to put together in tribute to something that was so iconic. We pushed harder and we grew with this car. We're super proud for this to be our current model. And as much as the name is Trans Am Worldwide, right now, after the two years of hard work and dedication, the face of the company is the SS now, for a little while, until we bring the next Trans Am in here.